Python versus Rust, a staff engineer perspective. It all started when I joined Mability. I was tasked with building their backend systems for Telesist. Their current infrastructure was written in Python. And I'm telling you, I saw all these leaks, all these problems trying to get the thing to work fast enough without consuming as much memory and CPU. Many of the problems, and this is full disclosure, were actually in C and C++ because it turns out that if you look at any serious streaming framework in Python, these things are all written in C++ and C already. They just have wrappers for Python. As we scale the code base, it was so hard to refactor it because Python, being a dynamic programming language with no compiler, is just so hard to maintain a big code base. And that's when I said, screw it, I'm not doing this. Instead, what I did is using PyO3, I started to wrap the critical parts of the Python system and rewrite them in Rust. And it was everything I hoped for. And then moved on more. And as we moved more stuff to Rust, our CPU usage went down and down and further down. Get down. <laughs> until I remember one blizzard last year. I just, I just stayed in the office. It was snowing outside. And I have the receipts. Look at this stuff. And I just completed the rewrite 100% in Rust. I got to leave it the frostbite because I, I didn't have a scraper. So I was like scraping my car with my hand. But it all matter. I had a smile on my face the whole time. So if you're expecting a neutral review of Python versus Rust, you will not find it here. I have too much experience with both. And now I know the problems with both. So yeah. It is what it is. Let's go for it. Let's start super simple. And the simplest I can think of is we're going to implement a Fibonacci sequence function. So Fib, we're going to hint <laughs> types because we know that Rust actually cares about types, but Python doesn't. So if n equals to zero, then return. Cool. Now I introduced an error. I did not add the return statement here. So let's see what uh, Python does. I think we know what's going to happen. But let's do it anyways. Boom, it blew up. Because it, it didn't care that the signature of this function is supposed to return an integer. It allowed uh, when n equals 2, it allowed it to go through here. And because this, this line does not return anything, then this function effectively returns none. So, you know, I, I don't like that the, the tools do not help you with this simple error handling. Sure enough, we fixed that and the code uh, runs as expected. Now let's do the same thing in Rust. So I am going to start using sign integers and then we'll move on to something else. If n equals to zero, then minus two. Let's see what happens. We'll create a little runner here, n, and then fib of n. There you go. Cargo run. Boom. So it didn't allow me to run the program because it noticed that it's supposed to return uh, integer 32 bits, and this uh, branch does not return that. So I like that. That helps you to move fast when you're programming. Sure enough, we had the same program. Awesome. Now. Let me show you a couple of things. So Fibonacci sequences are defined only for positive numbers. What happens if I try to pass a minus one? So let's see what it does. Stack overflow. So can you have stack overflows in Rust? Absolutely. Here's the, the proof. Now, how do we fix it? Well, since we know that Fibonacci sequences are defined only for positive numbers, let's constrain our input to unsigned numbers. And if we do that, then uh, the program won't even compile when we try to pass a negative number because the types won't match. End of story. Now, how do we accomplish something similar in Python? Well, let's first see what happens if we try to pass a negative number. Similarly to Rust, we run into a Stack Overflow error and uh, how do we deal with it? 
because types here don't mean anything, we can add an assertion that says assert that n is equal or larger than zero. And if we do that, then when we try to call the program with a negative number, we get an assertion error. And that's the end of it. But we can do better. So in modern uh, Python, you can use match statements. So let's change it. Nice. So that works. Now let's do the same thing in Rust. We also have a match statement in Rust. There you go. Let's see if it works. Yes, sir. One of my bigger goals here is I want to um, tell you that actually Rust is not very verbose. So in this particular implementation, and I'm sure that you'll be able to come up with something more, much shorter than I did, we see that the Rust implementation is actually shorter when it comes to line count. So both languages are object oriented. The main difference between the two is that Rust imposes composition, while with Python, you can either use composition or you can use inheritance to build your object tree. Now let's create a real system. I'm going to stop out a video streaming client similar to what I did for my mobility, but without showing like obviously the internals and stuff. So I'm going to do this in Python and then in Rust, and I'm going to show you some differences between the two. Let's start by defining what we're going to build. Our system will consist of six mock cameras that will stream to six BP9 encoders. And the output of those six encoders will go to our one single web transport client. Let's start by defining some domain classes here. So here we are defining a camera with a very with the default constructor, and we just define we are just assigning a name to it, similarly to the encoder and the client. So far so good. Let's do the same in Rust. Here's the equivalent in Rust. Notice how we specify the properties of the struct upfront, as opposed to like dynamically in the constructor. Notice how we had to separate the definition of the struct from the implementation with all the methods. And finally, in Rust, we have strong types, while here I could put like an int and run it, and this, this will be valid Python. Next, we are going to instantiate all six cameras using a fourth comprehension. So you can see how we are stuffing the six cameras into a list using this nice one-liner. Same goes for the encoders, it's exactly the same kind of logic. And last, we are going to create a single web transport client. Now let's do the same in Rust. So notice how the range syntax is very elegant, slightly different, but it effectively accomplishes the same. And then how we map through each element in the range to create a new camera. And notice how at the end we need to collect all the items that we generated with this iterator into a vector of camera collection. And we need to specify this, else the compiler won't know how to map the values back and we'll get a compiler error. Same goes for the encoders, same exact thing, syntax. And for the client, because we are not calling the constructor here, the new constructor, this is how you create the struct. Here are where things are going to really get interesting because I need to define a type to send packets back and forth between the camera and the encoders. And there are like 10,000 ways to do this. So here's what I did. For Python, I defined a base class called image. And there are two subclasses, PNG and JPEG, each with its own properties. In case of Rust, this is, this is really interesting because in Rust, enums can, have, can store data. So I'm storing the JPEG image instance right into the JPEG enum member, which is kind of cool. Let's say that we want to add a log method to our image. How will we go about that in Python and Rust? One way to do it in Python will be to add a log method right into our image class and then using reflection, just go through all the attributes in each of the images and just print them all out. In Rust, what we can do is create a trait, which is similar to an abstract class even when you can provide that default implementation for logging and then have each of the images implemented. So here's the implementation for JPEG image. And here's the implementation for PNG. 
And then if you want to be able to say image.log, then we can also implement log for image. And then using pattern matching, we can finally print our, our image. Let's talk about asynchronous programming. For this demo, I'm going to use AsyncIO for Python and Tokyo for Rust. These libraries are similar, so the idea is to maximize your CPU usage by scheduling asynchronous jobs within the same thread in the case of uh, Python, because that's all we get. We just get one thread. And in the case of uh, Rust, Tokyo is capable of spawning a worker thread pool that uses as many cores as your computer has, or you can also use a single thread if you, if you want to. It's the same goal. These libraries really, really shine when you are doing IO bound jobs, such as calling APIs and stuff like that. So in reality, if we were to implement a video streaming framework, Probably we on, we will only use AsyncIO in the web transport client for all the video encoding. We'll use real real uh, threads. Here's how we can start AsyncIO in Python. Loop AsyncIO.get event loop. We'll get the current event loop that you already created or just create a new one. Then we are going to create six queues to buffer all the images that the camera is producing to be sent to the encoders. And finally, we need to create one more queue so that after encoding the images, we send them to the web transport client. Then we are going to initialize six tasks, one per camera, and notice that at the syntax here, we are zipping the cameras with the camera's queues so that we can very elegantly initiate the tasks in just two lines, which is pretty cool, I think. And we are going to do something very similar for the encoders, but notice that instead of passing just the camera queues, we are also passing the cloud queue. And we are go, we'll go ahead and implement these, these methods in a second. But one thing I want to point out is that when you call create task uh, from Python, this means that uh, Python is going to schedule uh, this function asynchronously. Uh, so that means that it will launch the function and move on to the next line, meaning it's a non-blocking method call, which is pretty cool. Okay, full disclosure, this is where things get a little bit tricky with Rust. So here is how we create the channels in Rust. You'll notice that there's this dot .eater method that we're calling that we don't have to call in, in Python. And this is because of the memory ownership model in, in Rust. Here we are saying, I want to borrow, I want to borrow the elements in these cameras uh, vector. That's why you need this. Then you map through all the elements in the, in the cameras. And for each camera, we are going to create a channel with a capacity of 10 elements. You're going to create a channel with a capacity of 10 elements. And then we are going to transform this back into a vector. So eh, tricky, tricky, tricky. I get it. Then we are going to create the cloud channel. So this is equivalent to line uh, 61. So you can see that it's a little bit more verbose because in Rust, because again, the memory ownership model, we need to differentiate be be between the sender side of the channel and the receiver side. We are using a multiple uh, producer single receiver model or single consumer model. So you can clone the sender side as many times as you need and pass it around while you can not do that with the receiver. Let's keep going here. Here, okay, all this stuff from line 94 through 104 is equivalent to to these two lines in, in Python. This is, again, a result of the memory ownership model where we need to be very explicit about how we uh, 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 borrow these elements. So while on line 84, we said we were going to get references to the cameras, here we are saying like, no, 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 I actually want to uh, get the cameras by value, which means that now, the Tokyo, the Tokyo task is going to, to own the cameras moving forward. I know, don't tune out. 
I know this this is that was a mouthful and we'll break it down over time. But the long story short is that this is more verbose because of the memory ownership model. Hopefully that makes sense. And then we are doing the same thing. We are sipping the cameras with the channels and starting the, the tasks. And we have to do the same thing with the uh, with the encoders. So this is exactly the same, the same thing. Now let's move on to implementing the the tasks because we we define the code to start them, but we actually then didn't define the tasks. So let's do that. Okay, let's go ahead and implement camera.run. So what we're going to do is we'll start a while true loop where we just generate frames and then we try to put them into the queue so that the encoder can pick them up and then we sleep for a second, meaning that our cameras are streaming effectively at one hertz. And if any of these two functions throw an exception, we are going to catch the exception and break from the loop. And we are going to do something similar for the encoder. Encoder works almost the same. The only difference is that after reading a frame coming from the image, here's where the encoding will take place. And then after encoding the frame, if that's successful, we'll send that over to the web transport client. Moving on to the Rust side, I get to show you a few more keywords here. So check this out. Effectively, this while true is turned into a loop a keyword and it's effectively the same, accomplishes the same. It's an infinite loop, same logic, we create a packet and then notice how we handle the errors in Rust. Sender dot send will return an error as opposed to throwing the error. Then we say, well, if we receive an error from sender dot send, then print it and break from the loop. So very similar to what we are doing in, in uh, Python. Let's look at uh, the encoder. Moving on to the encoder. There you go. So on the, on the encoder side, we, can, we get to learn something new. In Rust, you can do while let some packet, and then this means while this condition is true. So while you are getting, while you pull packets from the receiver, then just keep running this until you get an error. How cool is that? In my opinion, this more functional way of handling error is much cleaner and easier to follow rather than the uh, the pattern that Python uses, which is to raise uh, exceptions. After implementing a web transport client both in Python and Rust, which is very similar to what we already covered, that's why I didn't go into it in detail, we have a working implementation in both languages. Let's go ahead and run it and see what happens. Fantastic. So we have two working systems. That's awesome. <laughs> All right, friends. So here's my assessment. From a verbosity standpoint, Rust definitely, definitely loses here. Python is a lot more succinct, cleaner, nicer to work with. No question about it. Moving on to error handling. In Rust, the error handling is very explicit and I like that. In Python, we saw how very often we just had to raise exception and hope for something to catch those exceptions, else the whole application crashes. I do not like that pattern. I feel it's error prone. I prefer Rust pattern of explicit error handling, 10 times better. Moving on to ergonomics, Rust is pretty complex, mostly because of the memory handling and the borrow and ownership rules. So because of that, I'm going to give it a minus one. Python is so much more nicer and easier to pick up. So ergonomics, 100% Python wins. Readability. I think it goes along with ergonomics. Rust is much more complex. It's not as straightforward to read. So with that, unfortunately, I'll give it a zero and Python gets a one. 
And from a maintainability standpoint, even when we did not, we did not really explore this in our, in, in our program because it's too small. But I'm telling you, as, as soon as you start to split your code into multiple files, you'll see that it's so hard to maintain your program. It's so hard to refactor it because you just don't have a strong compiler. You find all the programs, all the problems at runtime, and that's very unfortunate. So because of that, I'm going to give it a one to Rust and a minus one to Python. And in terms of memory safety, well, Rust is in infamous for having a great uh, memory safety uh, system. So the borrow checker can be a pain in the ass, but it does deliver a memory sound programs. So with that, I'll give Rust a one. But, but Python is not that bad. So Python is garbage collected and it does, it does what it's supposed to. The issues arise when you start using all these lower level C APIs that have leaks. So the C library leaks are exposed to Python. So because of this, I'll, I'll just give it a, a zero. Um, and this is a tie. So wait. Probably I know what you're thinking. Why do, Why not just selecting Rust? That's what I always do. And the reality is that after spending some quality time with uh, Python, I realized that it has a lot to offer. It's, it's, it's very easy to use it. The ergonomics are fantastic. So I do think that Rust has a long way to go. There's opportunities to make it simpler, easier to use. And I'm looking forward to see where the Rust team takes this language. Cheers.